Carrie Negon, thanks for being with us as always. Uh, Carrie, starting with you, uh, how are the Indigenous hunters doing? Um, it's really interesting what is transpiring here in the province. We're seeing more focus on hunting, traditional hunting, using hunting as an educational tool. There's a resurgence of land-based education. And right now I'm seeing a lot of communities having community hunts and places where they're teaching the younger generation some of the traditional practices that go along with, with hunting and um, stewardship. The interesting thing, though, as this is happening, we're seeing a decrease in the amount of places where people can hunt. Like there's has been a number of crown land sales that's taken place. So it's decreasing the places where hunters can go and actually harvest animals. And it's it's kind of sad, actually. Yeah, certainly a big issue out there in Saskatchewan. Uh, Negan, what are you hearing from the fields and streams of Anishinaabe territory? So absolutely, with you know, as Carrie said, uh, the pandemic did something interesting in our communities. It made people who were stuck at home, who were stuck close by to the local, often with relatives, to relearn hunting practices, fishing practices, traditional practices, even of harvesting the earth, harvesting hide, harvesting medicines uh, in different ways and, and learning about those techniques again. And, and I think that's a good trend. That's something that you see young people particularly picking up the work that our ancestors have done. But Carrie's absolutely right. There is an ongoing shrinking and shrinking and shrinking of public use land. And we only have to look to Ontario uh, in the famous sort of green belt that when there's green land, when there's nat natural land, you don't you see that being reduced time and time again by premiers, particularly the premiers, because it's the provinces that take care of natural resources and public green space. Uh, and so you don't see a lot of traditional territories being opened up. You see them shrinking. Um, you know, the one sort of exception, I think, is in Treaty 8, where you see thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres being turned over to First Nations communities. But that's due to treaty land entitlement, land that's already owed. Oftentimes, when we have land that's owed to us, it's not a green space that's given. It might be an area in, like, in a city or so on, or maybe a farm. And so there is an ongoing kind of tension that you're going to see more and more involving the issue of hunting, especially since young people are picking up that work and they're going to need a place to do it. Carrie, can you tell us what the, the Treaty Land Sharing Network is? It's a grassroots organization. It doesn't have any um, government um, influence. It's just farmers and Indigenous people who got together and decided that they needed to do something to honour the land sharing agreements that treaties are based upon. It, um, it came out of the the um, crackdown on trespassing laws and what happened with um, Colton Bushi. It was farmers within Saskatchewan who wanted to do something. They wanted to show Indigenous people that, you know, you're welcome and that we honour this treaty. And so it's just farmers who have gotten together and they have developed this organization where they have, they've opened up their land. They say what's available, whether it's berries, whether it's it's space where they can hold ceremonies, whether it's, um, you know, spots where they can go and hunt and harvest and use their land. The only requirement that they have is that, you know, they let them know when they're going to be accessing their land. And they have signage signage up on their property where, you know, you'd see no trespassing or private property. They have um, um, signs that say something about indigenous, um, people are welcome. I'm, I'm not sure of the exact sign. I haven't seen it, but yeah, they post signs on their properties saying that they are part of the Treaty Land Sharing Network. And, you know, you know, you just go online, log in, find out where, contact them and make arrangements. And it's it's a really neat grassroots organization. And I think it's, it's totally cool. They're not um, confining themselves to provincial jurisdictions they're going by treaties right now they're just working in treaty four and treaty six and they hope to expand across across canada and show people that you know individuals can honor treaty uh, given all that Negon, can you kind of put into context uh, for us hunting when it comes to provincial jurisdiction 
there was a really famous uh, sort of battle a few years ago here in Manitoba. Um, and uh, while it's important to talk about treaty, but generally indigenous rights that relate with the land often involve hunting and fishing. And uh, Premier, then Premier Brian Pallister uh, sort of famously announced that uh, there was a preponderance of indigenous hunters at nighttime. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, what he was talking about were two Métis hunters who were evoking their right as Métis uh, to hunt uh, and in a particular public territory at nighttime. And uh, it's a kind of typical stereotype of the ways in which mainstream society sees Indigenous peoples evoking their rights to access a livelihood, whether it be lobster fishing, whether it be hunting for game, uh, moose, deer, or whether it be fishing, uh, just generally for fish on a lake, like in Lake Winnipeg, for example. Uh, there's this kind of uh, demonization of Indigenous peoples that happens uh, when we are evoking our rights uh, that sometimes may be contrary or contradictory to the rights of Canadian hunters and fishers. And so as a result, we're often put in those situations of subservience or seen as a problem. But the fact is that I hope Canadians start to see that as we pick up more and, you know, perhaps surprisingly to some Canadians, we are hunting and fishing more than ever um, by wanting to return to our livelihoods, to our traditional ways as peoples, um, that we want to be able to create a society in which people can understand that this is something that our people have done for millennia and we're simply continuing that tradition we're not seeking anything extra or unique and unfortunately for many premiers uh, like then premier Brian Pallister but some of his contemporaries now they often treat our treaties as our treaty rights as something oppositional to Canadians when it simply is not. Kerry Negon uh, interesting conversation we'll have to leave it there appreciate you taking your time.